standing by turning to 564. Count your blessings. And let's stand together as we sing this evening. 564. Sunday back. That was a great time. Tonight we're a, a little bit less, but uh, we're still here to praise and God and, and thank Him. And, and I'm glad for everybody that came tonight and this morning as we've gotten the church back open. Um, next Sunday morning, I, I didn't really make any announcements this morning. I just did the prayer request. But um, next Sunday, uh, actually in the evening, uh, I think uh, we've We've changed plans here a couple times just because of the way uh, things were decided on, but we're going to have our graduation uh, banquet uh, next Sunday in the evening, I believe, and if something changes, we'll let you know, but uh, we'll have a dinner and, and stuff in the evening, and in the morning, we're going to have communion, uh, so keep those things in mind. We're uh, trying to exactly figure out how we want to do communion uh, with, uh, uh, you know, in this time of uh, that we live in, but I think we have a figured out and a good plan, so uh, we'd love to see you next Sunday. Uh, I know a lot of people were unsure about coming today, and, and that's okay, but we'd love to see you next Sunday, definitely next Sunday evening, uh, to honor those our graduates, and uh, we might honor some kindergarten graduates for a minute in the morning, and then uh, they didn't get their graduation either, so in, in, the, in the night, we'll have the, the big one for the high school seniors, and um, we got some Bibles coming in for them. But uh, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer, and uh, we'll continue on with our service. Uh, Father God, we're once again very thankful that we can come back together and worship in, in this building. And uh, Lord, I know there's a lot of people still watching online, uh, maybe ill, uh, maybe whatever reason it is, uh, maybe they're in another state, Lord, and and they can't, they can't uh, join us in, in, in person, but we're very thankful. And Lord, we pray that uh, each time that we watch this, these videos or we come to church, whatever it may be, or, or go to Sunday school, or, or maybe go to some conference, or maybe we just listen to a sermon on the radio. Lord, every one of those times, may we not uh, take them for granted. May we really try to dig deep in your word and, and, and may... May we learn something every time, something that hopefully uh, helps us think about uh, your coming kingdom uh, just a little bit more. 
And uh, Lord, we are very thankful for all the lessons we've been learning in, in the book of Luke and uh, as we continue to go through there. And uh, just bless the rest of our evening. In Jesus' name, amen. In your hymnals 541, He Keeps Me Singing. We'll sing the first third and the fifth verses. 541.
kind of a continuation from our Sunday school this morning. Some of the discussion uh, we were able to get into kind of uh, a little bit of it gets answered tonight, but um, John chapter 3, while you are turning there, uh, several years ago at my previous ministry, uh, we had been going through the book of Joshua in a Bible school. And I think Bible school had been over a week or so, and I kind of snuck down into the Sunday school class of the little kids. And, and I said, and they all said, hi, Pastor Josh. And I said, hi. And, and I said, who broke down the wall of Jericho? And they were all sitting there kind of staring at me, and a few of them had their mouths kind of open. And finally, one boy yelled out, I didn't do it. And I kind of was wondering, and I looked at one of the Sunday, the Sunday school teacher, and I kind of was like, that's what is going on? And, she, and, and, I, and I think that's what I said, what is going on? And she said, Pastor Josh, this boy is an honest child. I don't think he broke down the wall. <laughs> well, I was even more stunned by what the teacher said, Right? And uh, um, so I went and talked to the, I was talking to the Sunday school superintendent or director, or whatever they call him, and I told him everything that had happened, and the superintendent looked me straight in the eye, and he said, well, pastor, I've known the boy and his family for a, a lot of years, and I can't picture him doing such a terrible thing. <laughs> and I just kind of shook my head and, and walked away. Well, that week was a deacon's meeting. So I told all the men at the deacon's meeting the entire story. And after a moment of awkward silence, one of the deacons said, uh, spoke up and said, Listen, Pastor, just find out however much it costs and we'll cover it out of the deacon care fund. <sighs> just kidding. That never happened. I just thought that was a funny story. <laughs> Did I have you buying it? I had you buying it? <laughs> At least one person, okay. No, I just was kind of, I, I had read that a number of years ago, tweaked it to my benefit, and it was funny. So, I don't think it happened anywhere. But um, So, this morning in Sunday School, John chapter 3. And it's about two men, it's about Jesus, the, the most incredible teacher to ever live, obviously because he is God the Son. Uh, passionate, uh, excellent teacher, he, he preached with a Authority. And when he talked, people were on the edge of their seats and they wanted to hear what he had to say. No one else had ever talked like him before. And the other is a man named Nicodemus. Now he's called the teacher in Israel. Right? He's probably the, the top guy if there was a cabinet position for teacher. That's the, the position he held. And very, very smart, very wealthy, highly respected. And Nicodemus has been following around Jesus, listening to him, and, and he's a little stunned, kind of like uh, if that would have happened in my Sunday school class about the walls of Jericho. Nicodemus is just stunned at the things Jesus is saying. He doesn't understand them, and he wants to get a few things straight. So he arranges this midnight meeting between him and Jesus. And Jesus looks straight in Nicodemus' eyes, and he says things that completely knock his socks off. 
Basically, Nicodemus, everything you've ever known, working to get into heaven, being good, doing all these rituals and festivals, trying your best, you know, following the Ten Commandments, all that stuff is useless because you must be born again. Now, we learned this morning in Sunday School that that analogy uh, was to point out that salvation is of the Lord. In the same way we don't participate with our physical birth, we don't really participate with that spiritual birth. That's the Holy Spirit. It's a, it's a miracle of God. Well, we come this, tonight to verse 11. And Jesus continues on teaching Nicodemus because he's just not getting it. He's not grasping it. Uh, Nicodemus isn't getting this born again stuff. And this sort of kind of answers uh, Lyle and I were having a discussion a little bit this morning, and, and this kind of gives uh, the other side of it. Uh, verse 12, Jesus almost sounds flustered. Uh, Why should I bother you teaching heavenly things when you can't understand earthly things? And we'll start reading in verse 13. No one has ascended into heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the, he who does the truth comes to light, that... His deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. So if the theme of the first ten verses that we studied in Sunday school this morning, if the theme was born again, it's used five times, you can write it down, uh, underline them five times. If that was the theme word for the first ten verses, the theme word for these verses is believe. And that's what we were talking about in our discussion. The word believe here is used seven times. So the first step in God's blueprint of salvation is being born again. The second step, and, and these basically happen so uh, quickly uh, around one another, they're basically simultaneous. Uh, the second step is believing. Believing. Faith. Salvation is by faith alone. We, we preach that and teach that all the time, right? Uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone could boast. You remember that verse, don't you? Right? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. How about Romans chapter 4? For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, right? And was accounted unto him as righteousness. Right? Salvation is through faith. It is not by works. It's not even by a mix of works and faith. I remember the last church I was attending, that was one of the things the preacher uh, talked about a lot. He had a lot of conversations with people that thought, well, I can, I can mix faith and works, but I still have to do this. I have to believe, but I still have to do these things. It's not even a mix of faith and works. Salvation is by faith through grace. Faith is so Pivotal, very pivotal belief. It's required. And listen to how important it is. John chapter 20, it's, it's right towards the end of the book uh, that John wrote, the first book. He said, but these things are written that you might believe. Right? The entire Bible was written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now, some people come to me and they say, well, this is confusing. First, Jesus says you must be born again, uh, which is something that you cannot do, right? And now he says you have to believe. Believe and you'll be saved, right? Believe and you'll have everlasting life. Whoever believes will be saved. Anyone who believes can be saved is even another verse in Scripture. 
Something we have to sort of rationalize in our head is God is completely sovereign and in control of salvation, right, on one hand, but man is still responsible to believe. Okay? Now sometimes I think about that. Uh, how do those two go together? Well, I don't exactly know how they go together completely, but they are both in Scripture. God is completely in control, but man is responsible uh, to believe. How can that be? How does God's sovereignty and human responsibility go together? Did you know this has been debated and discussed for centuries? <laughs> um, at my Bible college, nearly every night of the week, if you were to get up uh, at about 2 a.m. and you were to wander through the dorm, uh, you would hear somebody debating or arguing this point. Always. Always. I mean, there's curfews and there's bedtimes and things like this. You were supposed to go to bed, but if you got up and snuck out, you would hear somebody arguing about uh, God's uh, sovereignty and human responsibility. You know, always, always, always. Uh, and that's fine to debate it and talk about it because they're both there. Obviously, in the scriptures, salvation is a work of God. You know, I think I quoted Hebrews, uh, whatever it is, uh, 12, uh, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, right? He, salvation is a work of God, but we are still held responsible to believe. Now, this is a very extremely difficult thing to understand I've been studying the Word of God consistently for 20 years or so now. Um, I grew up in a Christian home. I went to a Christian school. Uh, and, and I've added it up between Bible class and, and uh, chapels and Sunday school and Sunday morning and Sunday night, about 16 Bible lessons or sermons most weeks. And uh, this is still difficult for me to understand. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty mind-blowing that God is in control and sovereign as far as regards to salvation, but we are still responsible to believe. Now, as, as wild as this is, and as difficult as it is to get into these discussions, uh, one thing I want to point out as far as application tonight is Jesus didn't shy away from it. He talked about this deep theological paradox. And he didn't just talk about it with his disciples. This is outreach and evangelism with Nicodemus. He's talking about this. He says, you must be born again, but you have to believe. Both there. Okay? Both there. Um, Isaiah 46 Remember the former things of old, for I am God, there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. The bottom line is, we may not completely understand how those two go together, but God does. And Jesus, he's trying to teach us. The problem is, is the mind of God is infinite, and we are these feeble, uh, earthly creatures. So we may not understand uh, every detail about God and his ways. But in the end, what we see in Scripture is both the sovereignty of God and human responsibility to believe. So we can accept them both. Uh, we can realize uh, how we might not be able to synchronize them in our mind, which one exactly comes first or second. Uh, but uh, let's focus on this human responsibility for a while. We have plenty of time left tonight. Um, definitely from this passage here in John 3, sinners are responsibility uh, are responsible uh, to believe. And, uh, um, but, Jesus says you have to be born again. So they're, they're both there, and oftentimes when they're taught in scriptures, this is what really blows my mind sometimes, most every time those subjects are mentioned in scripture, do you realize they're almost always next to each other? To, is that to confuse us more? They're almost all Matthew 11. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son reveals him, right? God's sovereignty. Come to me, the verse right after it, 
all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Once again, human responsibility to still come to him. Interesting. John 6, and Jesus said to him, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Right? That, the human responsibility. But I said to you that uh, you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. There's the God's sovereignty. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. So these two subjects all over the place, right next to each other. In John 6 again, from the time, verse 66, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And then Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away from me? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, so, believing and, and once again, back and forth, God's sovereign choice in giving spiritual life and man's responsibility to believe side by side all over this book. Even if we don't completely understand how they go together. Romans chapter 9. Listen to this. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he who says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. And Paul continues to go deeper in this spiritual discussion, verse 19. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who has resisted his will? But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? Folks, very clearly we see that God is the creator. And the way he has chosen to set salvation up is exactly the way he wants it. And even if we don't understand it, it is fair, it is right, it is just, because God is right, perfect, and just. Right? He has to be or else he wouldn't be what? God. Okay? And, and sometimes we, we start to wrestle over this, like I, like I heard, like I said, a lot of people at college discussing this. Some people get very angry about it. And uh, for us to do that, we have to remember God has chosen to do this. God has chosen to give new life to whomever he wants. Look at the next chapter. But what did I say? They, these subjects are always right next to each other. Uh, chapter 9 is definitely about the sovereignty of God. Chapter 10 is all about the human responsibility of believing. Verse 13. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we're right back there to square one. God's sovereignty and human responsibility. In fact, Romans chapter 9, all about God's sovereignty. Romans chapter 10, all about human responsibility. Verse um, you know, instead of maybe debating this all the time, you know what Paul says we're supposed to do? Verse 14, Romans chapter 10. Anybody know that? We're supposed to go and preach. We're supposed to go preach. You know, it kind of comes to a point where we can have a friendly discussion, and that's good. What we did in Sunday school this morning was a good, healthy discussion. Uh, but ultimately, our job is not to find the answer to this conundrum of the responsibility or human responsibility and God's sovereignty. Our our job is to preach. You know, we plant the seed, we cultivate the ground, we water the ground, and God gives new life. I mean, God says, and Jesus said before he ascended into heaven in Acts 1.8, he says, Go, therefore, into all the world and preach, right? Preach to the ends of the earth. Well, that's cool, Pastor. I want to go preach in Hawaii. I want to go preach in Paris. You know, uh, I hear there's a lot of people that need the gospel uh, over there. Um, you know, honestly, we can start right here. We can start right here. We can start with our family members. I've heard lots of stories from you folks about how you've shared the gospel with family. That, that's great. 
then go to your neighbors. I, I was able to meet one of my neighbors yesterday. Uh, Kate Dushetsky, uh popped a tire just down my road, and, and I was able to go over there and help her, and the, the neighbor had already come out and started helping her, and, and we ended up having a great uh, conversation. We can, we can go with our neighbors. We can uh, preach to our coworkers. That's our job, without a doubt. Whether you're this strict Calvinist or whether you're Arminius or whether you're somewhere in between, it doesn't matter where you are theologically, we have to preach. God's job is to give new life and man's responsibility is to believe and we have to talk about that. I like how Paul sums up the discussion in Romans 11. Uh, this, this paradox, this conundrum whatever you want to call it. Romans eleven thirty three. 33, Paul says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor, or who has, given, uh, who has first given to him, and it shall be repaid to him. For of him and through him and to him are all things, and to him be glory forever. Amen. And, and that kind of sums it up well. Um, you know, I want you to be confident in God's plan of salvation. Uh, I want you to have faith that God knows and understands how everything works, exactly what order everything comes in. I mean, that's part of who God is. That's his job, right? He is the author of salvation. And uh, Jonah 2.9, he's the author of salvation. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12 uh, all we have to do is, is preach. That's our job. You know, there's, we've been seeing some missionaries that have been watching this and, and making con, con, uh, comments. You know, that, that's our job. Preach. We don't exactly know every little doctrine. We're probably going to argue and fight over a lot of different things, but we have to preach and trust God to handle the rest. I'll be transparent with you, sometimes, occasionally, we are preaching, we are sharing the gospel with somebody, and it seems like we share the gospel from this angle, and then we share the gospel from that angle, and then we do it over here this way, and with this illustration, and, and sometimes we say, I can't get through to this person. You ever have that experience? I can't get through. I remember this one young man, he was coming to me for counseling and we met for an hour and sometimes those, those sessions would go to an hour and a half, two hours and, and week after week I'd give him the gospel and, and he would just put his head down in his hands and cry. It's like I, I'm not getting through to you and and, and listen to this, Jesus Christ, right? The greatest teacher, the greatest preacher to ever live. What size were the crowds that he often preached to? Sometimes huge, right? Massive. Did you know the greatest teacher to ever live, there was some people he couldn't get through to? So don't get discouraged. Our job is to preach the gospel. Listen to this verse. This, when I first uh, was old enough to really understand things and I ran across this verse in a reading, uh, Acts 13, 48, it says, but everyone who is appointed to salvation will believe and be saved. So our job is to preach. Spread that seed of the gospel all around. And some of those people, they will believe. Not everyone's going to turn away. Okay? I want to encourage you with that. Um, next Sunday night, we will uh, break down the most famous verse in the whole Bible, John 3, 16. I, I figured this would be a good uh, verse to get people to kind of uh, get coming back to church and be interested in things, John 3, 16, next Sunday night. Uh, we're going to pray, and we'll, we'll do our last song, and then we'll be dismissed. Uh, Father God, we are thankful for the complexity of your word, that it is, that is very 
uh, complete and thorough and contains all the details of the things you want us to know. I'm thankful for the men and women over the last couple thousand years that have been studying it, that have been writing things down in the commentaries and, and the sermons that have been preached and the lessons that have been taught. And, and many of those we can review and, and read and, and that helps us kind of uh, get a grasp of, of some of the more difficult things in your scriptures. But Lord, ultimately I'm thankful for your Holy Spirit that helps guide us through this. Otherwise, uh, we'd be tossed to and fro uh, by every wind of doctrine. And, but ultimately, Lord, even though this is a, a con, can be a confusing subject, uh, help us to understand what our job is once we are saved, once we are officially believers, that our job is to preach the gospel and, and to uh, tell people that their job is to, to believe and be saved in order to avoid uh, going to hell. So Lord, even this week as we uh, go about our separate ways and as things around the state are starting to open up, uh, Lord, may we have many opportunities this summer uh, to share the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our final song, if you turn to 413, let's stand together as we close this evening. 413, take time to be holy.